you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as Mike said, please, uh, if you have questions, please do ask them and, you know, let's keep a kind of an informal in-person um, atmosphere as much as we can. It's a great, uh, I've attended many of these lectures and I think it's a great service to the community. So thank you for that also. So this is a joint work with uh, Oro Dentley, who's uh, uh, in the electrical engineering department at the Hebrew University and Oded Legev, who's the computer science department at NYU. So as you can see, it's a, it's a, it's the topic uh, is a topic in classical geometry of numbers. So this is a um, field that's enjoyed a lot of recent attention from both the computer scientists and the electrical engineers, and for different, completely different reasons, actually, unrelated. And they're and they are now, I think, like the experts and making the most progress in this field. So I'm happy to have such great co-authors. And actually, the main uh, new results that we have are based on work coming from a third direction, which none of us is really an expert in, and that's um, something called the discrete Kakea problem. Uh, and specifically, the new work is based on a recent work of Dar and Dvir that I'll tell you a little bit about um, at the end of the talk. So what's this about? So uh, uh, the, we're interested in the covering volume of a lattice. So let me define everything. So what is a lattice? A lattice is a subset of Rn, uh, which is spanned over Z. Uh, by independent independent vectors. So L is the span over Z of these vectors. Namely, it's all the linear uh, combinations of these um, V vector of these N vectors. N is always going to be the dimension. And um, another way to say this. It's uh, the image of the uh, standard integer lattice Zn under a matrix A, where A has got uh, the Vi's as its columns. So this is another way of saying this. And um, the geometry of numbers is the field in, in mathematics in, uh, initiated by Minkowski um, and studying the geometric properties of such sets. And the questions that I'm be talking about are classical in this field. So uh, the first invariant of a lattice is the co-volume. And this is defined to be the determinant of this matrix A. And uh, as you can see, uh, a lattice may have many different choices of these VIs, different bases, but the, uh, the co-volume does not depend on them. And what's the geometric meaning of this co-volume? Uh, omega, say, in Rn, a measurable set, say a Borel set, it's called the fundamental domain. For a lattice L, if it tiles perfectly, so in other words, you can write Rn as the disjoint union um, of the translates of omega by element of the lattice, okay? And I'll give an example now. So example, uh, take the lattice to be the standard integer lattice, take omega to be the unit cube, and I'm taking it uh, cl closed on the left, open on, on the right in every coordinate, then obviously every uh, element of Rn can be written as a translate of this unit cube. It's just like the standard tiling of, uh, of your floor by square tiles. Or if you like, you just reduce any vector mod one and you get uh, an element here. And you the difference between the element and uh, the original vector is an element of the integer lattice. So that's why we get this formula for these two sets, okay? And obviously the uh, if you translate the lattice, so if, L is the translate of a lattice by Zn, then you can also translate the fundamental domain. M, it, this will be fundamental domain for the translated lattice. And the determinant of L in this case 
is measuring the volume with respect to uh, standard volume of this set. So what this discussion tells us is that uh, the co-volume of L is the volume of a fundamental domain. And it's not hard to see, and this is kind of a standard exercise, that this does not depend on the choice of a fundamental domain. So um, that's uh, the first kind of standard quantity. And now we're going to have a lattice, and we're going to try to be covering space by translates of some other set, which might not be a fundamental domain. And in this talk, we'll denote this set by k. So k is a some set which we want to use to cover space efficiently. And we're going to take it always to be convex and compact. And we're going to define a function n l k x um, to be the number of times x is covered, number of l, sorry, The number of translates of K by elements of the lattice that cover our point L. So if I fix uh, L and K, oops, sorry. If I fix L and K and vary X, I'm getting a function from any point in Rn to, uh, to the non-negative integers. This number of translates that cover the number of times the points get covered. And uh, let me show you some pictures just so we are all on the same page. Let me just write down the, the fact here that, that there's the number that's going to show up in all the formulas is uh, the volume, oops, the volume of K divided by the covolume of L. And I'll explain in a minute that this is the average number of times a point in Rn gets covered by the translates of k by elements of L. And this is the, this is the um, uh, very important uh, number for us. So let's, let's show some pictures and so you get the feeling of for this. So here where I'm showing you uh, the, uh, the uh, center, the black points are center points of, a uh, lattice and the circle is our, our set k and here we're translating k by the lattice point so we get this uh, union of circles they don't cover space and they do overlap and so this point here maybe is covered zero times this point here is covered once points in the overlaps are covered twice so this function nlk x assumes three possible values, 0, 1, and 2 in this, in this example. And as we increase the radius of the ball, the, you see that the balls are intersecting more and more. After a while, uh, every point gets covered. So now in this picture, every point's covered at least once. And say points that are in these corner spots are actually covered three times. And um, this is the kind of picture that you might have in mind. As you can see, these pictures are obviously periodic. They don't change when you shift by L. So if you want to understand the average of the number of times a point gets covered, you just have to evaluate that on a fundamental domain. So if I'm going to, if I integrate the number, this pic, this uh, trap, this uh, parallelogram that I'm drawing is a fundamental domain for this lattice. Oh, let's just denote you know, it by omega. If I integrate the, note of the function n over that um, fundamental domain, I'm going to get the average number of times a point gets covered. So that's what I mean when I write this. So this is equal to one over the volume of omega integral over omega and lkx dx. And this is this equality here is a simple exercise that I'll leave to. It's just a, a kind of a Fubini computation. So this is a, a crucial uh, formula for us and uh, just for understanding the results, I mean. And uh, two standard definitions, uh, the pair convex set lattice is called a packing if this function never exceeds one, i.e. 
these uh, translates are disjoint. Either a point is covered or it's not covered, but when it's covered, it cannot be covered by two different points, two different sets. So the translates are disjoint. In this case, it's called a packing. Uh, KL is called a covering if uh, NKLX is always at least one. And this obviously happens when every point, every point gets covered. And so that then uh, we have this formula. Okay, so these are the notions of packings and coverings. And what people have been interested in for many, many years is to find, given a convex body, find a lattice for which you can um, use that lattice to get an efficient packing or an efficient covering of space by those translated, um, translated images of the convex body. And that's the problem that we're going to. These are the covering and packing problems. So let me state them formally. So the covering volume Uh, of the so suppose KL form a covering, the covering volume of KL is defined to be. Uh, it's this is traditionally no, uh, denoted by this um, capital theta, and it's defined to be the infimum. I'll write down the formula and explain. You take uh, your convex body K, and then you uh, it dilate it. You like conference. It's a cube volume. Uh, there's some question that I can't make out. In the... Maybe not. OK, so let me continue. So um, we're taking our convex body K, and now we're uh, making it larger or smaller by multiplying by R, and we're looking for the threshold at which uh, the minimal dilation needed to make this into a covering. So, and then we measure the average number of time the points get covered by this dilated copy of K. So if we go back to the picture here, to the pictures that I showed you earlier, you see that uh, as, as I move from this picture down to the next picture and down to the next picture, I'm dilating the ball, I'm making it larger. And then at cer certain instant, it starts to become a cover. And as soon as it's a cover, this is the first time it's a cover, I measure the average number of time times that this points, points here get covered. So points here are covered once, points here are covered twice. There are some few points where points are covered three times. The average is some number bigger than one by some small amount. Okay, so that's the quantity that we're measuring. So uh, the, the, the difference uh, theta, KL minus one is a measurement of the wastefulness, if you like, of this covering. And we make a similar definition with the packing uh, uh, quantity. So uh, you take the, it's, it, this is denoted in literature by rho. Rho of KL is defined in the following way. It's the supremum, again, of the volume of RK divided by the co-volume of L, where now we range over all dilates, which give us the packing. So Barak, just a question in the chat. Uh, yeah. uh, you assume that K is symmetric with respect to a point, is the question. No, no, I don't actually. Uh, in, sometimes it's assumed and sometimes it's not. I'm not going to assume that. Um, so this is a kind of the similar, uh, this this is, is measuring, this is always, so this number theta is always bigger than one and this number rho is always smaller than one because here we're averaging a function uh, when we're in the covering situation, we're averaging a function which is bigger than one everywhere. And here we're averaging, this is the average of a function which is smaller than one everywhere. So that's why we get uh, these, this inequality and the difference one minus rho KL 
is a measurement of the uh, proportion of space that's left uncovered by this packet. Okay, so I hope uh, the quantities are clear. And then once we've defined this for a given K and L, the next order of business is to try to fix K and search for the optimal covering where we range over all lattices. So uh, rho, let's denote this in the following way. Uh, rho, sorry, uh, let's start with uh, covering theta of K with a superscript N is the infimum over theta KL where L is a lattice in Rn and rho, K, rho NK is the supremum again of these quantities. Okay, now it's not hard to check that these are pure, truly geometric quantities. In other words, if I take K and expand it or translate it, I don't change the value of this quantity. And, and if I manage to uh, cover space optimally with a given lattice and I inflate the lattice again, um, uh, in other words, the um, value of this uh, quantity here uh, will not change, or this quantity here will not change if I replace L by its dilate. And so, uh, or, uh, okay, so this is, this is, these are the quantities that we are, are interested in. And this, is, this problem of finding these numbers um, has been around for a very, very long time. And they make an appearance in, even in Hilbert's uh, 1900 list of questions. And uh, they've been studied ever since, but still not much is known. Uh, the specific case that people care about more than others is the case of the uh, L2 ball. And that's the problem that's that's um, attracted the most attention. Uh, sorry, I want to keep this notation somewhat standard. So let me get a sub superscript. So rho n is my uh, notation for the um, packing density of the L2 ball in N dimensions. And so uh, very little is actually known about precise values of this. So, so this is known in dimensions um, two up to eight and 24, not in any other dimensions. And this is known in dimensions two to five. And that's it. So, and you know, dimension three is due to Gauss. I mean, various, various uh, well-known mathematicians have contributed to what we know. Uh, 24 is a very difficult case uh, where we see the leech lattice making its appearance and uh, uh, still many, many open questions. And the questions that I would like to discuss, which are also classical is question, how does uh, theta n, K, or let's say Kn behave as n times to infinity. What's the behavior in dimension getting larger and larger? Of course, uh, to make sense of this question, uh, K is always a convex set in Rn. So it's not about a fixed K. We fix a family of uh, convex sets in all dimensions. And we are interested in this quantity. For example, we might be interested in this behavior for the L2 ball, or we might be interested in this behavior getting bounds which are uniform and work for all Ks, all possible uh, convex bodies K. Um, and of course, I would be interested if, if I'd be very happy to be able to say things also about the corresponding quantity for rho for the packing, but we don't have any results of that type. So uh, that's not what I'm going to be discussing in this talk, but just to um, give you the background, let's start with what's known about rho, just so you'll appreciate that not much is known. So for, uh, the packing, uh, we have the following bounds. Uh, if you look at the uh, packing volume of the Euclidean ball, 
in dimension n, um, you get a lower bound, one half to the n times uh, n times the constant. The constants that, are, that will appear in the talk, there are gonna be lots of constants appearing in the talk. The constants that appear, um, you know, they're gonna change from one line to the next, but I'm always gonna denote them by c. It's not the same constant. You shouldn't be confused by this notation. This is not row to the n. This is the value of the packing density in dimension n. And the upper bound is um, roughly 0.67 to the power n. So there's a huge gap here between the lower bound and the upper bound. This lower bound was proved in a sequence of papers. So I'll, I'll mention just a few names. Just I'm trying to impress you. And, you know, I want you to feel that this is a classical problem. It is a classical problem, of course, but let me just mention some notable names here. So uh, Minkowski initiated this study, and this is um, in 1896. He proved the lower bound, which was um, which was linear in n. Uh, sorry, um, sorry, which was, had this uh, exponent one half to the n, but did not have this um, n factor. And Rogers in the 50s. 50, um, sorry, 47, was the first person to get a linear uh, improvement with this extra n term. And Venkatesh, right now the record holder for this kind of a problem is actually Venkatesh, who in 2013 uh, provided the best known uh, constant here in front of this. But as you can see, the lower bound is very, very far from the upper bound. The upper bound was established by uh, Kabatiansky and Levenstein. Oops, sorry. Wait, and this is for any convex body? No, this is for, I'm just explaining that what's known for L2. Okay. Uh, for the L2 ball, just so you get a feel for the problem. Um, Okay, so this is just to show you that there's a huge gap in our understanding. Um, and this problem has been around for a very long time for packing. Um, let's pass to covering. Um, so uh, here's what was known, and I'll, I'll say what was known before our results, and then I will um, uh, state our results. So uh, for the covering problem, let's start with the L2 ball. So for the L2 ball, we have lower and upper bounds from the 50s. The upper bound is due to Rogers, 59. The lower bound is due to Coxeter, Fura, and Rogers, also in 59. And so what you can see is that the upper bound and lower bound are very, very uh, I'm sorry, there should be a constant here. Oh, no, uh, all good. So um, as you can see, the upper and lower bounds are very, very close to each other. I mean, this is uh, linear in N, and here it's also linear in N, and the difference is uh, a power of a log. So it's not a, a huge gap, but it, this is you know still an open question to nail this. And uh, OK, so that's the uh, case of the L2 ball. But the case of the uh, general convex body, was um, the knowledge was there was a, a bigger gap in what we knew, and here's uh, what I want to state. So if you take the worst case, the worst convex body in dimension n, and look at the covering um, volume, Rogers had in the same uh, paper. In fact, he had a uh, n to the log log n, n to constant times log log n. So it's, it's a super polynomial function of n. And um, the lower bound, if you look at the worst case, in other words, the convex body for which you get uh, the covering to be as inefficient as possible, uh, nobody's found a convex body which is known to be more inefficient than L2 ball. So in other words, this is the same uh, Coxeter or few Rogers bound coming from the L2 ball appearing here. So now you can see that for general convex bodies, uh, we have actually a very big gap between uh, the upper bound and the lower bound in this problem. And our first theorem, which I'll uh, write as theorem A, uh, improves the situation. So 
the same quantity that I've written down here, we approve uh, the bound to n squared, constant times n squared. Um, that's our first result. And the next set of results that I want to describe are four typical lattices. So um, I'll explain why I'm interested in typical lattices. So what this result says is that if, if, if you give me uh, any convex body whatsoever, uh, I'm able to find a lattice for which it covers uh, and the average number of times a point gets covered is bounded by this number. But I'm not going to be able to actually produce that lattice for you explicitly. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be able to say that uh, with respect to some probability measure on the space of lattices, a typical lattice will actually behave in this way. So this is uh, what I want to describe next. So there's a natural measure. So I'm going to denote it by, Z, call it the Ziegelharm measure. So there's a, oops, sorry. There's a natural measure on uh, the set of lattices in dimension n. So I'm going to denote this by curly x n. So this is L in R n, L a lattice. And I'm going to only look at lattices of covolume one for all these geometric problems. Uh, reducing to lattices of covolume one uh, makes no uh, difference. But when I do that, uh, this set becomes a quotient of uh, a Lie group by a discrete subgroup. It's the quotient, the famous quotient SLNR over SLNZ. And this is to see this, you just uh, notice that uh, if I look at uh, the coset uh, ASLNZ, think of this um, as a coset in this coset space, I can map it to the standard lattice ZN multiplied by A, as I was doing before. And this gives me a general lattice of covolume one, as I described before. So um, this map is uh, bijection. And this map here identifies the space of all lattices of covolume one with this quotient. And that's very nice. In particular, um, this becomes a homogeneous space for a Lie group. And the Haar measure on the Lie group can be used to produce a nice measure on the space of lattices. And that measure, that's the measure that uh, I'd like to call the Ziegelhaar measure. So mu n is the Ziegelhaar measure on xn, i.e. this is the unique uh, SLNR invariant Borel probability measure. on this space. So it turns out it's a fact related to the theory of Haar measures. Uh, that's why Haar's name is appearing in this uh, discussion. And uh, this was first observed by Siegel. It turns out that there's a unique such measure, probability measure on this space. Uh, I, I guess I'm going a little bit slower than I intended. So um, I can, with respect to this measure, I can state the following theorem. Uh, so I'll write it all down and then I'll uh, explain what's going on. So the uh, statement is uh, bounding the measure. It's showing you, this, this, this is a probability measure. So I'm telling you that the measure of a certain set is large, which means a typical lattice satisfies this property. A typical lattice uh, for every epsilon, I can find a constant C so that a typical lattice uh, where typical means outside a set of measure epsilon, a typical lattice satisfies the bound that I had before. In the theorem A, I told you that there exists one lattice 
for which uh, theta KL is less than a constant times n squared. Now I'm asserting that a large measure of such lattices have this property. So this is the measure estimate that's behind theorem A. Um, now it's telling you, so I'll write it down in words, a typical lattice uh, gives a covering with um, theta KL less than CN squared. This is the, so for each, uh, for, uh, for each K. And constant C is independent of the convex body K. Um, that's our second uh, theorem. Uh, you might wonder why I'm stating a theorem about behavior of typical lattices in such a convoluted way. Usually if we work with measures, the first thing we might, might ask is what's the average uh, with respect to this measure? What's the expectation of this covering radius? And, and if I were to prove to you that this expectation is uh, of this order, that would be kind of a result of a similar flavor. However, the expectation is completely different in fact. So remark, uh, the expectation with respect to this measure mu n of this quantity. So I'm varying L according to this measure and measuring the expectation, it's infinite. Somehow this probability measure has what's known as the thin part of the space or the cusp. And in this cusp, the covering function, the covering volume explodes to such an extent that the expectation is infinite, even though it occupies a small measure in the space. So that's so that's just to explain to you that what I've discussed is sort of the natural uh, way to express the fact written uh, over here. Okay, that's I've explained to you the results in the first half of the title. I haven't told you about almost uniform covers, so that's what I'd like to do now. Uh, I'll, before doing that, I'll sort of explain the idea. So again, I'm turning back to these pictures, and what you're seeing in these pictures is that when I pass down in these slides, I'm uh, dilating the ball, and eventually the balls cover. Now, what would happen if I were to dilate the balls even further? Uh, what would happen is that points are going to get covered. And um, just imagine the radius of this ball, instead of it being this size, it would be much, much bigger, it's, say this size. So uh, points are going to be covered by lots and lots of balls. And you might ask, what about this function? And the fact is that this function becomes almost uniform. It hardly fluctuates, it's becoming almost a constant function. And that's what we want to understand. We'd like to know when it is. It is it's easy to show that this eventually happens we'd like to somehow put our finger on what's the volume at which the function becomes almost uniform. So that's, uh, I'll formalize that. That's the, our next uh, quantity that we wanna measure. Again, uh, another thing to say here, all the results I've mentioned so far have already appeared in one paper. And what I'm now describing is, is the newer stuff. So let's define for um, K and L as before, a quantity eta of KL, this is the maximum as x ranges over Rn of the ratio of the number of times x gets covered by the average. And we subtract one. So we expect points to be covered uh, this amount of time, that's the expectation. And this is the fluctuation, uh, the ratio of the fluctuation of the actual quantity to the expectation. On average, this is one, but we're taking the worst case. In other words, the point X where this uh, ratio is um, as far from one as possible. And notice that if this eta is less than one, we're back to saying that this uh, function is bigger than zero. So we have a covering. So note, eta less than one implies KL is a covering. Okay. Um, now um, let's define another quantity. So we want to know the kind of given an epsilon. So given positive epsilon, let's define psi KL of epsilon to be the infimum of the quantity that I measured before, 
the average. Uh, do you mean returns, eta greater than one or less than one? Less than one. So if you're less than one, I meant less than one. So if you're less than one, what does that mean? It means that this the, saying that this maximum is less than one means that for every point, this quantity is less than one. It means that for every, uh, this can't be zero. If this were zero, we'd have zero minus one, which is one. So it has to be bigger than zero at every point. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm defining something, let's call it define the uh, epsilon smooth density. This is just a name that's supposed to help convey the idea, but it's defined by the following formula. Um, I increase R until the first moment when my former, when this, uh, this quantity that I defined before becomes smaller than epsilon. As I said, eventually uh, this, when I increase the radius, as I showed in the pictures, this quantity is going to go to zero. So I wait for the first moment at which it's less than epsilon. And I call that the epsilon smooth density. It's the minimal average number of times points get covered that ensures that they almost get covered uniformly where almost uniformly means with respect to this parameter epsilon. Okay, that's a bit of a mouthful perhaps, but nevertheless, let me state the theorem. Uh, so I have two parameters in this theorem, uh, epsilon and, and sigma, and I take a soup over all convex bodies and I measure, I'll write it down and then I'll explain. Okay, here's the theorem. Let's try to figure out what it says. First thing to notice is that we had a power of two in previous results, and now we have a power of three. And we have a parameter sigma, which you should think of as being small. So you should think of this quantity as being very close to n cubed. It's a little bit bigger than n cubed. And this is saying that if we take any convex body, that's why we have a soup here, and we want to inflate the lattices so that we get an epsilon uniform cover, uh, then it's enough to inflate to volume, to uh, average covering number, n cubed. In other words, the quantity that I mentioned before is just a little bit, uh, it's, it's, a, it's roughly n cubed. So let me write sort of in words what we're talking about. So this approximately means uh, I'm going to compare theorem B to theorem C. So theorem B means uh, that for any K uh, with high probability, uh, if we uh, take uh, dilate of K of volume and squared for most L, uh, KL is a covering. Uh, theorem, um, the, the next theorem, theorem C says, so this is this was about, what I just said was about, um, uh, sorry. What I just said was about theorem B and I, I'll switch a color and I'll talk about theorem C. So theorem C approximately is a for any K with high probability, if we take a dilative K of volume, and cubed now, uh, for most of the, this is an epsilon uniform covering, i.e. eta is less than epsilon. Okay, so that's the meaning of uh, this theorem C. Um, I, I really uh, am grateful for the opportunity to present it here because um, I'm hoping one, some of you will be interested in this quantity. This is not a quantity, as in contrast to the previous quantity that we discussed, um, 
the covering volume, uh, this is not a quantity that has been on uh, anybody's radar in pure mathematics uh, literature, but uh, it's very, very natural from the point of view of the computer science and electrical engineering applications that I mentioned before. And uh, well, we like it, we think it's interesting. So uh, this is an opportunity to uh, publicize it. So this is, those are the three results, theorems A, B, and C. Um, I'd like to say I have about, uh, a little less than 10 minutes. I'd like to say something about proofs. So um, I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, the names of Darren Dvir. Uh, Darren Dvir gave us a crucial input in the theorem of theorem C, in the proof of theorem C. Uh, earlier, uh, the earlier work in which we proved theorems um, A and B also got a crucial input from this field called the study of the discrete Kakea problem. Um, and I'd like to say a little bit about that. So what is the discrete Kakea problem? So this, this is an ingredient in the proof. Um, we're looking at the uh, field, P is a prime number, and we're looking at the uh, field with P elements, and we're looking at the vector space of dimension N over this field. And we have a subset in this finite set. And this is called a Kakea set if it contains a line in every direction. What that means is for any, uh, I'll write it uh, with kind of slightly complicated notation because that's gonna be useful later. For any element of the Grassmannian um, of one dimensional subspaces um, in FP to the N, uh, that's this notation appearing here. Uh, you can take that line and you can translate it uh, so that this translated line lies to this. So it's clear that the larger S is, uh, the better chance it has of being a okay, case that's satisfying that it contains all these lines in all possible directions. And the uh, belief was for a while that indeed a set had to be quite large in order to satisfy this property. And there were many conjectures and the breakthroughs, many of them are associated with the name of De Vere. De Vere proved in 2008, the following well-known result, uh, if S is a Kakea set, uh, then its size of S, I'm not going to um, uh, do too much to do justice to this result, but uh, I'll just state it because it should be stated. Um, so he pro provided a lower bound on the size of a Kakea set. The amount, the uh, relative size of a Kakea set relative to the size of the, of the entire uh, vector space uh, decreased in terms of the parameter P, the number of uh, elements in the field as a constant, depending on the dimension uh, over P. And this was a breakthrough that people uh, thought, people had much weaker uh, lower bounds before him. Uh, what we care about in, in actually in this work is about Kakea sets of rank two. So let me define Kakea sets of rank R in general R. So S in FP to the N is called a Kakea set of rank R. Um, if, oops. Uh, it's a similar definition, except I replace the Grassmannian of lines with the Grassmannian of R dimensional subspaces. And there was a bound of, uh, let me not write down the names, Koparti, Lev, uh, Sadun, and Saraf in 2011 uh, obtained a lower bound Uh, and I'm, I'm focusing on the case of rank two. And in rank two, their lower bound 
had the following form. Um, and this, this was crucial for our work. So let me very, very briefly, and uh, I'm not going to state that there's a, the, this, this input here, um, this theorem here is what we needed to prove theorems A and B, uh, and a slight improvement of that, which I won't go into. Uh, for theorem C, we needed a further result of Dar and Tvir, as I mentioned in the very beginning of the talk, that result came out um, uh, earlier this year, or maybe last year, I'm not completely certain. Um, and so further, further improvements along the lines of these works are what feeds into our work. Okay, uh, very, very briefly, what does this all have to, what do these problems have to do with each other? They seem completely unrelated perhaps. So uh, how does this work? So I'll give you the idea in a nutshell. So uh, connection, oops, connection to the covering problem. You'll understand our technique. So first step, we're trying to, we're given a compact set and we're trying to find an economical a lattice for which we get a lattice for which we get an economical covering using this compact set. So the first step is a step called discretization. What does that mean? I'll just show it by pictures. So uh, and let's just write down embed L in a dense lattice L prime, which is one over P times L P is a prime for reasons that will become apparent in step two and cover L prime instead of Rn. So let me show you the slide, the picture. Um, in this picture, think of P as being five. So the original lattice is are these black points. And I'm introducing a new lattice, L prime, which are the red points. It's the original lattice scaled down by a factor of five. So every fundamental domain here now contains five squared, which is 25 points. And instead of, I'm telling you that in our, if I want to understand how large um, the balls should be so that they cover uh, the red points, sorry, so that they cover all of space, it's enough to be able to cover uh, the red points. And then there's this idea that I, if I inflate it just a little bit more, I'll be able to cover all of space and I won't lose much. So that's the first idea that requires some work and that's called discretization. Now that we have that second step, I'll, and I'll end with that, step two, uh, replace uh, L with span of L V for some V in uh, L prime mod L, which is uh, FPM. Okay, so what's going on? So L prime over L and all those red points that you saw before, and that can be naturally identified as an additive group with this vector space. And if I choose an element from this vector space, um, I can add it to L and thicken the lattice. Thicken the lattice by one dimension. So I'll show you an example. Uh, the example is right here. So what would happen if I change the collection of black points by adding all of these new black points? I'm, I'm making the lattice thicker by adding one vector and spanning a new lattice. Well, the circle gets translated in a certain direction. And as you see in this picture, maybe it covers already, covers all the red points, and then we win. And that's going to be our goal. Our goal is to be to choose this extra vector so that we can just add it uh, to the lattice, which just means push around this um, the, the, the set using it and cover the red points. And if you, that's what we are going to try to do. And if you think about what that means is, this picture explains what's going on. So this is the fundamental domain for our covering problem. And then some of the points are already covered. Those are the points in, in this light blue color. And some of the points that we want to cover are not covered. These are the points in this red set. So let me just take a picture of all of the points I've already covered and all of the points I'd like to cover and think about what does it mean for my strategy to fail? 
what it would mean for my strategy to fail is that I cannot add, I can't push this picture around and cover space. And if I can't push this picture around and cover space, that means that in any direction that I take, the red points contain a full line, which means that the red points are a Kakea set. So the, the relation between the two problems is what makes my strategy fail is if the complement of the points that I've covered form a Kakea set. And if I know that this Kakea set has to be uh, large, that means that these points have to be small. Uh, that's sort of the starting point of our analysis. So I know this is not much of an explanation, but it's the best I could do in the 50 minutes. So let me stop here and thank you for your attention.